Well, you know, uh, Glenn Greenwald pointed out something on his blog. I forget which poll it was, but he had a screenshot, little picture, uh, JPEG, of some poll results that said that a majority of Americans, I guess, who answered other than I don't know, falsely or mistakenly believe that what the NIE said was that the Iranians are making nuclear weapons right now. Oh, that's an impressive mistake. <laughs> it's like the numbers of Americans who believe that Iraq was behind the uh, bombings of September 11th uh, after eventually most of the news media came through and uh, were square about it and said that Iraq, and even Bush, though not Cheney, said that uh, Iraq had nothing to do with it. And yet, you know, one found somewhere like 2006, still 50% of Americans thought Iraq was behind it. It's just amazing because, you know, November really wasn't that long ago, and there was a whole giant media course. I mean, this lasted in the news cycle for a few weeks that, all right, well, we got this NIE, so you can't have a war now, and this was everywhere. It was even on TV. Yeah, I agree. It, the, the forgetting or shrouding or wadding off or suppression of that fact that the legitimate American government statement about the state of Iran's nuclear research and preparations uh, had gone the other way from this uh, judgment we're now told that uh, George Bush and many others in his administration have assured uh, the Israelis that they agree with. Now, the Israelis I have in mind now are not the head of the Mossad, whom you just cited, but Ehud Olmert and Ehud Barak. I, I think Barak, perhaps the more belligerent of the two, the defense the originally labor uh, defense minister who had been taken to be not a hawk, but who now looks far more eager to go against Iran than, than Olmert is, perhaps. Well, um, who is this guy, Benny Morris? It seems strange to me that the New York Times would print this, and I guess I'm shocked but not surprised, something like that. This is a pretty, you know, hey, if you don't do this war then we're going to probably end up having to nuke them all to death and turn Iran into an atomic wasteland, yep. he says. I mean, He says is, nuclear wasteland. That's right. Yeah. Those are shocking words. I mean, this is the New York Times. This is the newspaper of record. This is, you know, every government leader, establishment, bureaucracy, <clears throat> intelligence agency in the world read this Friday. You know, this is important that this is in here. This isn't just an essay written for little green footballs or something. Yeah. And that would take a whole separate <laughs> excursion by both of us to talk about uh, Benny Morris and what he represents and, and his changes of view between the late 1980s and, and the present. But, I mean, he's a, he's a labor Zionist, left-wing originally, and uh, grew up on a kibbutz, went to Cambridge, uh, was for a time a, a reporter for the Jerusalem Post. So his, real, his earliest career was in journalism, but he's a archivist and, you know, really turned around the self-consciousness of Israelis about their own history in this book uh, on the birth of the Palestinian refugee uh, problem in, in 1988. Uh, so at that time, people took Benny Morris to be what they called a revisionist historian, one of the new historians, and he was pointing out that the expulsion of Palestinians uh, in the war of 1948, uh, not of all of them, but of many, had not happened simply because the Arab government told them to leave and they left or because they were panicked about the war. Uh, some of this had been uh, coerced and supervised and commandeered by Israeli armed forces, and there had been, in the process of it, massacres, poisonings of wells, and so on. Now, these are the, what to say, the darker side of almost any war, but it was Benny Morris, among others, who brought it out concerning Israel's founding. He was born in 1948. So there's a very curious, I suspect, identification with the country in, in complex ways. Well, um, it sounds like recently maybe he was mugged by reality. Oh, no. <laughs> that, that horrible neoconservative line, yeah. You might say so. I mean, I'm, as I read it, and I'm not a close scholar of his development or, of, or indeed of, of the history of uh, Israel, but I think Benny Morris was a you know, a supporter of the Oslo Accords and somebody who hoped that the Palestinians uh, would get a separate nation, that there could be peace between Palestine and Israel. And I, as I see it, as, as it's come out in two or three interviews of his that I've read from the last few years, uh, he seems to have been shattered by the experience of the Second Intifada, uh, where the suicide bombings began and 
life in cities in Israel and uh, on the roads and so on started to seem dangerous. Uh, it'll not, not as it was dangerous in Baghdad for many, many months, but something that we Americans really have no way to enter into from our own experience. So he turned around then and I think began to feel that the expulsion, though grim, may have been justified, necessary, that there was no alternative. He said in an interview in 2004, that I cite other parts of the interview in that uh, Huffington Post uh, thing that I put online the other day, but he said also in that interview that uh, maybe uh, Ben-Gurion should have finished the job. Uh, and by finished the job of expulsion, he meant, uh, you know, the transfer of population of the Palestinians should have gone all the way so that Israel would have had a, a state of, of all Jews rather than uh, a state whose central identity was Jewish but which has uh, other citizens as well. This they Times piece is very extreme. It's more extreme than I think anything he would have said in Israel. Huh. Well, as far as the uh, finishing the job thing there, he was talking about not just kicking everybody out of the West Bank, but kicking all the Arabs out of Israel proper. Yeah, I think that's right. It's a phrase. He, he thinks in phrases as, as um, forgive me because I write journalism too, but as many journalists too often do, he uses phrases as a substitute for thought. But yeah, I think it was the idea of, a, of an all-Jewish state. But the more interesting question which you bring up is what is the New York Times doing publishing this? And I think it's that's part of a larger pattern of trying to move the center uh, or uh, what counts as legitimacy uh, within American opinion uh, very far uh, from where it has been. I won't say far to the right exactly because left and right have become such peculiar and hard to scrutinize terms now. But let us say far to, farther towards war, farther towards a presumption in favor of war than it has been in the past in America. Though I have great skepticism about the Times and its editorial policy, I would never have predicted they could have done this. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I guess with the whole um, shocked but not surprised thing, it, it does seem like a little much, but then again, these are the guys who unapologetically lied us into war in Iraq and just let Michael Gordon and Judith Miller write whatever they felt like on the front page. And well, yeah, they did not, uh, they did not uh, supervise or edit well uh, those people who were basically a pipeline from uh, neoconservatives and now discredited spies into American policy. The Times was, a, was an important conduit for it, yeah. Well, and their basic New York Times editorials have kind of forgotten about the NIE, too, haven't they? Don't they talk again about the nuclear weapons development? Well, that... it's, it's curious. The Times, you know, what it gives with one hand, it takes with the other. I, on the very editorial page uh, where they had the Benny Morris piece of threatening and promising an attack on Iran on the right side. On the left side was the unsigned editorial, essentially, I believe, backing Condoleezza Rice and hoping that the peace process works out with Iran. It's confusing, and it is. I think the confusion is both deliberate and uncontrolled. I think one could say the, the drift of the times in the last year has certainly been towards making normal or normalizing, if you'll allow that, the idea of violent action against Iran if Iran does not unconditionally give up nuclear research sometime very soon and that the U.S. Uh, will preside over a solution to its satisfaction. It will not go through al Baradai or the U.N. That's one. I think the Times has been pressing towards that. Iran must be solved and it must be solved on terms satisfactory to America and Israel. And the other is that they want us to stay in Iraq. They've been very consistent and oddly upfront about that. They published that really partial, inadequate, it almost incompetent, unqualified uh, endorsement of the surge in uh, June 2007 by Kenneth Pollack and Michael O'Hanlon both of whom had been strong uh, endorsers of the war from the start, and they allowed these guys to build themselves as critics of the war. But that, if you remember, was a, a, that was an important moment, the middle of, middle of last year, 